the Two Tall Sports Podcast is back with another episode today. My guest is Zach Parker. He is uh, an independent film producer who won a bunch of awards at the South by Southwest Festival and also in Cannes in France. Uh, he had a European tour for his short independent film, Thunder Road. And uh, he's a former professional baseball player. He was originally from Texas and uh, played with the Colorado Rockies organization and Texas Rangers. He also played in Taiwan and some independent ball as well. So we dive into all of that and we talk about various things with movies and producing and the reason he came out to LA and uh, the, the cool transition from baseball to the film industry for Zach. So great interview with him. If you're watching on YouTube, it does go dark later on. Bear with us. You're here for the audio and it's just the irony of a film producer not having the, <laughs> the best uh, quality uh, video this time around. But I'm hoping to work with, with Zach and his uh, media group, Diamante Media Group, along with some others that are involved there. So stay tuned, hopefully, for some cool stuff down the road uh, with myself as well in the Two Tall Sports Podcast. As always, you can follow the show on social media at Two Tall Sports Podcast. You can find me on Twitter at Two Tall Sports. Um, you, if you'd like to email the show, Two Tall Sports Podcast at gmail.com. And uh, as always, you can listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music. You can watch the show on YouTube. Check out my YouTube channel. Just type in Two Tall Sports Podcast. And uh, please enjoy the show today and would love to hear your feedback. If you could subscribe, rate, and review wherever you can, that would be awesome. And uh, enjoy the episode with Zach. We'll see you on the other side. Okay, welcome back to the Two Tall Sports Podcast. My next guest is a former professional baseball player. He was in the Rockies and Rangers organization. Uh, he was drafted back in 2000. Uh, he played his college ball at San Jacinto Junior College in Texas, and he also played professionally in Taiwan. He transitioned into a movie producer and uh, won an award for his independent film um, in Europe and also uh, at the South by Southwest Festival a few years back. And I will hopefully be working with him very soon with some media stuff. And he is the head of content at Diamante Media Group. He is Zach Parker. What's up, Zach? How are you doing? Uh, not a lot, man. Excited to be here, Brett. Hey, thank Thanks you, man. That, Glad for that intro. For sure. Glad to have you on. You deserve it, man. You're doing cool stuff. A lot, a lot, of, uh, lot of stuff going on. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Okay. Well, uh, before we get to your career and all that stuff, I just want to ask you in general about 2020 and what it's been like for you and your family and, and your businesses and all that stuff. So what's it been like over the last, you know, eight, 10 months? Um, wild, right? I mean, eight to 10 months, it feels like, uh, two weeks, yeah. but, um, but yeah, it's, it's been, I mean, I, I just like with everybody, I've been super lucky in that, um, you know, haven't had anybody get critically ill. And, um, but yeah, I think it's, <laughs> it's put a kink in everybody's plans and it's, it's made everybody sort of uh, reassess what they're doing. You know what I mean? I, I think, I think a lot of good ultimately will come from it in terms of the business side. Um, Cause I think it's, it's proven that a, a lot of media jobs, at least the media I came from, can be done remotely and everything doesn't have to be so centered in LA. And, and, you know, we can, we can talk about it in a little while, but one of the reasons I, I, I sort of went to make an independent film was because I just didn't want to be so tied to one industry in one location. Like I felt like I needed to be able to, you know, spread out and potentially live other places if I wanted to. And, it, um, and I think, and I, even back then I was like, a lot of the stuff can be done remotely. Like, I don't know why we have to, do it this way and uh i'm curious to see how we come out of this um you know who knows if we ever get back to a, a true normal or like whatever it looks like but um you know i'm trying to take the positive and, and hopefully uh we can we can uh streamline you know whatever industry you're in just kind of streamline and, and kind of uh keep people's happiness at a higher degree as well as um you know be efficient with the business yeah, definitely, man. Hopefully uh, things do get better and, you know, but it is always nice to, I'm sure, you know, film in person, right? You get those, you know, the, the personal side, the connection. So it, it will be nice to be, you know, on set, if you will, with people, hopefully very soon. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, the same time it's, it's, it's frustrating, but it's opened up opportunities for literally anybody and everybody to do anything they want. Nobody, you know, 
nobody's judging you right now because you're doing, you know, uh, a, a Zoom call as a, like, why can't he get that person in, in his house? Or why can't they meet in a studio? Like, like the barrier of entry now is nothing for people to, to make stuff. So in that world, it, it's been just a, a, a boon for people to, to kind of get in and, you know, we're at the point where like, if you had an idea for something, there's no excuse not to be doing it right now. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's giving so, people a chance um, to step back and kind of, you know, get realign themselves with what they're passionate about. So just like doing a sure. podcast. <laughs> and, and I mean, and, and, and have you, you know, maybe, you know, for instance, maybe one day you want to host a, a show on TV, like for you to be able to, to do this for a year or two when the world's upside down, like, this is where you're taking your licks and this is where you're learning. This is like your minor leagues before, you know, I think it's, it's um, an interesting place to be able to, to make a bunch of stuff and truly have it rest on the content you're making. Not if you have a dope camera, not if you have perfect lighting, it's really about the content you're putting out in the world. All that other stuff is easy. You know, like when the world opens up and, and you've got great stuff, it's easy to find somebody with a cinema camera it's easy to get somebody to come in and light it for you. Right. But it's, it's hard. It's hard to find stuff that people want to pay attention to. Definitely. So I, I, I commend you for, oh. for what you've been up to. This is Well, thank you. I appreciate it. But uh, no, I'm excited to, to work with people like yourself. So, um, but we'll get there in a little bit. I want to talk about your baseball career for at least a little while. Um, yeah. You know, I, you grew up in outside the Austin, Texas area for the most part of your, your younger life. Um, what do you remember about when you were growing up playing sports and were you always just into baseball or were there other sports you were interested in too? Uh, I mean, it was, you know, growing up in Texas, it was everything. Just whatever season it was, you were playing it. And, um, but then when it got to it – was, it was like high school where it, it, baseball really kind of stood out from the rest and – you know, a lot of people close to me were like, look, you, you're fine at football, but like, <laughs> the, it's, if you want to play just to play, that's fine. But if you want to have a future in sports, like you should probably stick to baseball. So, um, you know, in baseball, you can do it year round. So it's not even like a seasonal thing in, in Texas. So, um, so yeah, I just, I went all in on baseball uh, going into high school and just really never looked back. And obviously being left-handed, you know, a lot of people probably did tell you, you know, you got a, a decent shot here because everybody's looking for a good left-handed pitcher. So um, as you're, you know, getting later in your high school career, you know, senior year, what were your thoughts on college and maybe where you might end up? I know you went to uh, San Jacinto, which is a junior college, but did you have any other offers for Division One or Division Two baseball? Yeah, I was, I was a bit of a late bloomer. So I, I was always pretty good. Um, but yeah, going into high school, um, you know, it was always like, I mean, I remember wanting to be a pro player, but like it, it almost seemed surreal. Like when I think back at that time, I don't even know if I knew what that meant really. So it was definitely about getting to college. And, you know, of course, like everybody, I, I wanted to be a big dog. You know, I wanted to go to UT. I wanted to go to, you know, the, those, those schools and, you know, the Miami's Arizona state, like all the stuff I was watching on TV. Um, and to be honest, I was a little frustrated. Um, I had a couple offers, but they were very small. Um, and then the junior college thing came and it was San Jack. They, you know, they're sort of a prom every year. They're a top team. And, um, and yeah, so, I mean, I, I went that route and looking back on it, it was absolutely the greatest thing that I, I could have done. I mean, going in there and like immediately being the open day starter, getting a hundred innings in that first year, really kind of learning how to maximize my, I just, I don't think I would have done very well at a D one kind of sitting on the sidelines, throwing bullpens, you know, like I, I think I needed to be thrown into the fire and, um, and man, and with the rules with junior college, man, I, I, even to this day, I recommend everybody. Like if you're a stud and you can go to any D one you want, still go junior college for a year, just a year pitch a ton and see if you, you know, get, go first round or whatever that the next year. So um, looking back, it was a great thing. And after that first year, I had, I had a really good year. So at that point I had the pick of the litter to where I wanted to go. And so I was, I was really excited to be in that situation for sure. Um, and I ended up committing and signing with LSU and this was back in the day. So it was 2000. So it was 
the last year of Skip Bergman, they had just won the College World Series. And so I, I committed with them, but then ultimately ended up signing uh, with, with the Rockies. Right. So you, you were uh, part of that draft and follow process. So what, if, for, for those that are listening, don't understand that, how did it work with the whole draft and follow where they drafted you, but you didn't sign right away. You got to go back to school and then you eventually signed with them. So how did that all work? Yeah. So it was, um, it was this process where they could sort of, it was sort of major league baseball's way of calling dibs on you where it's like they saw something in you, but you weren't necessarily ready to be signed. So I was signed out of, uh, or I was drafted out of high school by the Braves. And what that meant was like, they came to my house and they were like, Hey, you really showed us a lot this year. Uh, but we don't want to, we don't want to sign you. We want to follow you and track you uh, at San Jack next year. So it was just a situation where I had close contact with my scout and he would come out to all the games. And, um, at the end of that year, they had my rights up. I think it was up until 24 hours before the draft. And so, um, you know, they, they made us a, a, a couple small offers, but it just it didn't feel right. So I went back to the draft and the Rockies got me and they offered me something low too, but it was essentially a draft to follow for, for them. And then um, went out and had, you know, my real breakout was after my freshman year, I went and pitched in the Jayhawk League up in Kansas and just had a fantastic summer pitching against all the D1 kids. You know, um, there were only like three or four JUCO guys on each team. So you were basically facing, you know, cream of the crop. And so coming off of that, it was just, you know, it was sort of a game changer. So that next year it was, you know, ton of scouts and, um, you know, and it kind of, the direct and follow kind of gives you a little bit of leverage. Like I really, I, you know, I think it was beneficial to be able to kind of like play against, well, there were, 20 you know 29 other scouts there last week like somebody there wants me so um so yeah so it was a uh, um signs you know a couple of days before the draft with them and and kind of had to bypass that whole you know you know the draft is like it's a yeah. crap shoot like you might go high one day but you know you might slip so it ended up working out pretty well i was i was excited to to sign for sure yeah, definitely. And you got signed by the Rockies. You finally made it official. And then you uh, start your career in uh, low way, I believe, in the South Atlantic League, right? Your first full season? Yeah. So I finished up that summer, pitched maybe 20 or 30 innings in, in Pioneer League and rookie ball. But right. um, okay. But yeah, that first year went uh, South Atlantic League, Asheville Tourists. That's right. Asheville. Yeah. And you, yeah. Uh, you dominated that year. What do you remember about that first full season for you? Man, that was that. That was a great year. That was that was fun. Uh, but it was, but it was, it was a struggle. It was a transition. So, you know, I I definitely sort of needed a month to kind of like realize I belonged there. I remember, you know, and I was, and I sort of came in right before this like analytical movement and the the velocity movement. And I, so in my day, it was still very much like you're a pro now. It doesn't matter how hard you throw. Just get out. And we, we knew that wasn't true. You know, I mean, looking back, it's like they still want the, the guys throwing gas. So um, so I, I took that approach. And I remember just like trying to go through the motions and hit spots and learn things. And I was like three or four starts in and I just was getting lit up, man. It wasn't it wasn't good. And then I, like, I, I vividly remember, um, you know, throwing mid 80s. And then I walked a guy I walked a lefty. And he went to first base and he told our first baseman, uh, he said, I've never seen a left. I've never seen a pitcher throw so slow. And like, for whatever reason, that like pissed me off. Really? Like I was mad. So the next start I came out and I was like, I'm just going to let it eat. And I it was immediately like 89 to 92, you know, like six shut out. And then I just took off from there and then um, ended up having a great, you know, had a good team, so I ended up getting, like, it's almost comical in the minor leagues, but had 16 wins for that team. Um, like, led all of minor leagues in wins. But, you know, it's one of those things where you kind of look back and you're like, well, you know, most people don't lead the league in wins. It's because they get called up, you know. They, right. they start jumping up. But that was a fantastic year, man. I had a, We had awesome guys. Asheville's fantastic. Um, and that league, you know, it had a very, like, Bull Durham feel to it. So. I really kind of liked um, being down there. And I mean, it's just a, like a fantastic experience to be your first 
your first year riding the buses to be in a South Atlantic league. That's crazy. All you need was a little kick in the ass from the other team and you just turned into, you know, the lefty that they wanted you to be. Right. And I'm shocked it, it, you didn't get called up mid year anyway. Right. With, with that many wins. Yeah, it was, it was, a it was, a it was a situation. There was something like in high a where like, something was going on and there were some whispers of it in the last month, but I ended up just staying put. And I was, you know, I was one of the younger guys on the team. So they were sort of plotting it out a certain way, but, um, but yeah, it was, it was, it was a great year, man. It was, um, and I just, yeah, I mean, I needed that. I needed that, that kick to realize that like, just because I'm at the next level, you know, it's, it's I'm playing against the same guys I was playing against last, you know, it's, it's, that idea that we're all moving up and these are just the same bozos that I was getting out last year. So, um, but yeah, I just, it, it's one of those like light bulb moments. I just remember the first baseman coming in the dugout and laughing. And I'm like, what are you laughing at? And he was like, he said, you like are the biggest poo thrower ever. And I was like, <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to prove that guy wrong, I guess. But, uh, but yeah, that was, I mean, that was probably, um, you know, obviously one of my favorite years, but, but, it, but beyond, beyond pitching well, it was just a great group of guys. And I feel like in a ball, you're in pro ball, but you're still so far away from the big leagues that you, there's, you don't feel that immediate pressure of like, you know, you know, nobody thinks they're going to get to the big leagues that year. You know what I mean? So, right. yeah. And, and a lot of, and, and a lot of guys aren't necessarily getting released. So it's, you're kind of in like a little bit of a stable situation as opposed to, the closer you get to the big leagues when things get super volatile and, you know, cut the road and all of yeah. a sudden you got teammates sort of secretly rooting against you and stuff. And, you know, it definitely you know how happens. it happens. It definitely happens. Yeah. Sure. It's just funny you brought up, uh, cause that's such a, a minor league term, just sling in 80 poo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> For sure, uh, man. Yeah. And now it's like, I mean, I thought I was hot stuff when I was like 80 to 92. And it's like, I don't even know if that would register these days. It's tough. Like yeah, that's it's... if you're 88, 92, you better be like a submarine guy or something. Right. right. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's been a wild uh, transition the last 10 years, kind of watching it from a distance. Yeah. And you log, I looked at your career, you logged a bunch of innings um, and you got to double a with, with the Rockies. Um, and you played with a bunch of big names, uh, including, I saw, I think Matt holiday, Ubaldo Jimenez, Clint Barmas, Chris Iannetta, and of course, Ryan Spilborch, who we'll talk about a little bit later, who you're working with now, but, what do you remember about the guys you played with in the minor leagues in the Rockies system? Um, yeah, I mean, just so much, man. It was a great group of guys. Um, Jeff Francis was another one of those guys who ended up getting 10 or 11 years in the big leagues. And um, it was just, they really were all good guys. Like when I think back, like none of them, you would like no matter how big of a prospect they were like nobody sort of stood out as like a, a, a in your face bonus baby or something it was uh i feel like everybody was truly pulling for each other like you know me and francis were like direct competitors like we were both left-handed starters but like i couldn't have been rooting for that guy harder and, and i feel like he uh he was the same way with me um but yeah it's been great to watch those guys uh you know spilly is a classic character and Ionetto is one of the, you know, the guy owns a winery now. And he was, I remember in the clubhouse at big league camp, our first big league camp together, like we were, you know, off in the corner, like by the bathroom or whatever, like hidden basically. And everybody's sitting in there like, you know, BSing. And he was reading like Carl Sagan and, and like metaphysical stuff. And he was just like a next level, like super smart guy. And, um, he, yeah, just a, a bunch, a bunch of really cool guys. They, um, a lot of memorable guys for sure. What do you remember about playing at least in Double A when you got to? Did you feel like you were getting close with the Rockies? Did you feel like you were kind of a guy at that point? You know, what do you remember before you you left them? Where where your your mindset was in your stance in the organization? Yeah, so I after that first year, um, obviously I kind of hopped to the you know prospect watch list for sure went and had a really good uh first half in the Cal league the next year ended up I made the all-star team but then right at the all-star break I had to go and have surgery I had bone chips so my elbow was bothering me but I still had you know a fairly good struggling through all the, that uh those injuries I still threw pretty well and so that next year I came back and started in double a kind of a rehab year that that year in double a was was 
no, no bueno. And then my second year back in Tulsa, um, I kind of turned the corner and had a, an amazing first half. Uh, I think I was like 11 and one at the all-star break. Um, second half, we lost, we lost a bunch of our guys. So the team didn't play as well, but still threw pretty well and dealt with a few little nagging injuries. But like, I felt like I was on a good path. And then after that year, then it was, you know, big league camp and, um, and I actually started the next year in AAA. So I was the number two starter in AAA the next year. Um, and that's when I just, I sort of hit a wall where the, the little nagging injuries turned into something uh, larger where I, I started having some shoulder issues that sort of went undiagnosed for a while. Um, you know, it was, and that, that was a rough year because it was, uh, you know, feeling like you're so close and being in AAA and having some good games, like having some like, eight inning, two hit shutout type games, and then other games just not being able to find the zone. And so just trying to figure out what was wrong and, 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 and remedy that was, was tough. And then I ended up going back down to double A halfway through the year to kind of figure it out. Um, and then, and that was kind of like, you know, I, I think, and then I went to the Rockies the next year, but that was sort of like, without it explicitly being said, like you, you kind of know when like, they turn the page on you a little bit. Yeah. It's like you, whether they realize it or not, you start feeling like a little bit of the cold shoulder from, from the people. And so, uh, but I, you know, it, it, it's how it works. And, you know, so, uh, and then I, you know, I learned a big lesson with the Rockies is when I got released. Ultimately I was in the middle of like being somebody's pet project. Like one of the pitching coaches, I was just like, you know, I was like a shell of myself. I was on the mound and I was thinking about everything you tell me. And, and then I got released and I was like, well, shit. Like if I'm going to, if I'm going to get released ever again, I want to go out my way. And so from then on, you know, every, everywhere I played, I was very open to information, but very adamant that like, at the end of the day, I just need to go play because I, it's, it's too hard to kind of like live with the fact that you were playing poorly and you were, you know, you were doing drills and thinking about like mechanics on the mound as opposed to just getting out there and competing. Um, but yeah, my time, my time with the Rockets was fantastic. I, I, I'm still in contact with a lot of those guys and um, yeah, you know, they took that ultimate chance on me at the beginning. So forever grateful for those guys. Yeah, definitely. And it's, it's hard to, you know, they, they're the ones that liked you out of the draft. So it's hard to, you know, not like them, but they also, you know, weren't, they started to devalue you even as you got closer to the big leagues and the injuries, you know, there's, there's a new draft class every single year. So you just become a number at that point. Um, yeah. I often joke with people sometimes like I, at least I've been, you know, used to call it like going from prospect to suspect and it happens, you know, a lot in the minors for sure. Yeah. And it, it <laughs> happens seemingly, seemingly so fast. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, but I mean, at the same time, again, I get it, man. I, I sort of went to, uh, I got to a place where I just couldn't get over the hump of whatever that, that sort of injury was. And, um, and yeah, so, I mean, it, it was, it, it was understandable because I was just as frustrated with myself as, as, you know, however frustrated they were with me, I was twice as frustrated with myself. You right, know? right. Um, I want to talk about your time in the Atlantic League, which is the independent baseball league that I actually played in as well in Long Island, as some of you know, but um you actually got to play for, they call it Lancaster, but we call it Lancaster, yeah. <laughs> Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which is in like basically Amish country of Pennsylvania. So what do you remember about playing for Lancaster? Yeah, Lancaster. And they will <laughs> correct you every time. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, I absolutely loved my time with the Barnstormers. I, again, I, I was, when I got there, I was a man on a mission, man. I, I was, I was pissed off at the Rockies for releasing me. I'd finally started to figure some stuff out with um, what was bothering me with my arm. And so I was able to kind of get over that hump. And I came in the beginning of, of August that summer. And, um, my first, and I started uh, three or four games in August and was like pitcher of the month. And it really like, man, I came in just pr trying to prove the world wrong and, and threw really well there. 
but even beyond throwing well, like I just, I really enjoyed it. Cause I feel like the Atlantic league outside of the big leagues is like one of the only places where you're actually trying to win baseball games or, or like in Mexico where like, you know, you're, you're trying to win the, the division or you're trying to win the, uh, the league. There's no, there's no coddling prospects in that league. And so it was fun to kind of get in that atmosphere and just go uh, balls to the wall, just trying to win games and not, you know, I mean, you've seen it in the minor leagues where a guy's throwing a, a, an amazing game, you know, it's sort of the, uh, what was it? Uh, the world series, like the Rays. Guy pulled, hits a, yeah. Yeah. The guy hits a pitch limit or whatever. And, the, and there's a lot of that in the minor leagues, but in the Atlantic league, man, they, they didn't care if they blew you out, if they could get a couple wins out of you. So it was, uh, it, it was fun to get up there and play. And that, that community, uh, Lancaster was so, I mean, they, like they show up, man. It was like a fun stadium. It was, it was a great league. I, uh, I, uh, I, you know, I, I think fondly of those, those days in the Atlantic league is it's cause it's a little bit, you know, it's a little bit like the wild bunch because there's no, cause again, these guys, you know, there's no organizational precedent or, you know, so if there's guys in the clubhouse smoking heaters or whatever, like some old grizzly vets, like they just don't care. You know, it, it's yeah. not, they're not worried about like if it gets out to in my, you know, minor league baseball.com or whatever, it's just people trying to win baseball games. Right. No, it's a lot of fun. And you definitely, uh, the way I tell people, you know, when I, the first couple of months when I got there, I was like, all right, the only thing I'm worried about right now is getting back to affiliated, you know, major league baseball or in somebody's system. But once you start to kind of lose that, you start to enjoy it more with the guys and, you know, playing cards and all that stuff in the clubhouse and the bus rides and all that stuff. And it's just, you bring yeah. the joy comes back and it's just more fun and it's loose. You know, everybody's on their own program. There's no team defense every day. There's none of that stuff. It's all about just enjoying and winning games like you were talking about. Yeah. I, and, and, and usually that makes you a better player. I mean, I felt like I found – you know, I found a lot of stuff on the field, but I also found like my love for the game again uh, of just wanting to go out and let it rip. Who, but you on Long Island, and that's that's kind of always the feeder, the feeder team back to the bigs. So, who did you have any former bigs on your? Any, yeah, so uh, the studs? Mr. Long Island Duck is Lou Ford. I don't know if you remember that name yeah. from the Twins. He's he's still playing. He's like player coach now, which is insane. But it's amazing. Uh, yeah, so he was like the main dude there. But ironically, the year I was there, 2014. We really didn't have anybody signed back to Major League Baseball. But I've seen in the random other years, like Rich Hill was there and he got signed back. And there's been other guys. Dontrell Willis was there even too. Yeah. So names that you know. But um, the year I was there, not a lot of guys got back to Major League Baseball. So, um, was, but, yeah, go ahead. Car, like, I just remember when I was there, it was Carl Everett, Danny Graves. Uh, I mean, it was like th there were a bunch of, like, former All-Stars, man. It was – and it was fun to see them because they were truly like, yeah, they want to get back to the big leagues, but like a lot of those guys were pretty set for life, you know, so yeah. they, they could really go out and have fun with it. And um, it was always cool to see how somebody like Carl Everett would get up there. And if the guy on the mound was like a kid that never got out of a ball, how they would just play with them, dude. And Tim yeah. like literally like lean on top of the plate and just <laughs> do whatever they could to rattle somebody. It was just, it, it was, it was a fun, it, it's a fun league. Definitely. And you pitched well enough. You got another shot back in uh, affiliated baseball with the Texas Rangers and you got to go to double A with them. What do you remember about that transition going back to affiliated ball? You're in double A. Do you think you again have a shot to get to the big leagues? Yeah. I mean, I, I was sort of at that point where I truly believed I had a shot, but I was done with trying to map out my, my plan. Yeah. I was like, man, I'm sick of wasting mental energy of trying to like, be the chess master and figure out what are the moves for me to get there. Like, I just need to pitch my ass off and like, whatever happens, happens. And that was fantastic because I, um, you know, being from Texas, it was cool to be with the Rangers, um, the Texas league. Um, I, that's where Tulsa was. So I was familiar and Frisco's got a fantastic stadium. So I was really fired up and, um, and I threw, I threw pretty well there. Um, but we were just absolutely loaded. And um, we had basically the team I was on that next year was the World Series team. Neftali Felice, uh, Derek Holland, Matt Harrison, Chris Davis, just Elvis Andrus, just all these 
all yeah. these studs, man. So we and that, but that was a that was fun too because we we won the first half by like ten games, won the second half, like we just dominated, man. I don't know if we ever lost two games in a row that whole summer. It was whoa, it was fun. Yeah, that's a great experience for you. Um, you know, unfortunately, you didn't get to stick with them for long term, but you got an opportunity to play in Taiwan professionally. What do you remember about that experience? So Taiwan was fun, man. It was something that I was actively seeking out. Like I'd played with a bunch of guys who um, had been over there and, and spoke highly of it. And I was just sort of at that point where I wanted to expand my horizons a little bit. Like I knew baseball was not over, but it was like it was winding down, you know. So I, I wanted to get over there and, and that happened. And again, the, I enjoyed my time, but I, those nagging injuries came back and I got to where I could pitch on a very set routine. And when I got to Taiwan, I just couldn't, I couldn't figure out what I basically I needed a chiropractor and they, I just couldn't find a chiropractor over there. And so, um, yeah, it just, and when it got bad, it got bad, man. Like it was so weird cause I still had velocity. Um, and my arm didn't hurt, but when my arm would mess up, I just would have no, no feel for the ball. And yeah, I, by the time I left Taiwan, man, I couldn't hit, I couldn't hit water if I fell out of a boat. And, <laughs> and you know, and, and you know, I, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but that's absolutely the worst thing as a pitcher. It, like velocity, pain, that's all one thing. But like, when you truly don't have confidence that you know where the ball's going within feet, that's that's where, you know, that's where you're praying on the mound. To you, I hope this guy hits a home run. I hope this guy hits a double. I just want to throw it in an area that we can play the game because it's just, it's just, it's a helpless feeling, man. And I had I'd experienced that a few times and it was just, my shoulder would kind of fall out of socket a little bit, not dislocate, but it wouldn't sit right. And it just, it, the whole kinetic chain was, was messed up. And uh, those are, those are dark times. It's a lonely mound when you don't know where the ball's going. It definitely is. And I had a, I actually had a hip surgery. I had a torn labrum in my hip. So same as your shoulder, you got a labrum in your hip too. And I, I tore my labrum, had surgery, and I had the same issues coming off of a surgery. Just the trust factor and mentally getting over the injury itself. And is this each pitch, is this going to be okay? And it's a tough yeah. climb after recovering from that. For sure. I mean, I was talking to a buddy uh, the other day about it, and he had gone through it as well. And it was just like, Man, if you if you ever want to like try to manipulate and be a bad person, like go to a, a a rehab facility with a bunch of athletes, because after those surgeries, man, like physically, mentally, emotionally, you were sort of just like putty at that time because you know no matter how bit how whatever your swag is, how confident you talk, like it's just a it's a it's a hard time because you don't. You don't know if you're going to come back from it and it starts messing with, with everything. It's uh, those are just really fragile situations to be in. So I want to transition to your, when real life started for you. So you leave Taiwan, you come back home to Texas. What happens next at that point? Um, yeah, that was, that was real life. It was um, the beginning of, I always, I always knew I wanted to do something after baseball, but it was, um, it was the first time I had to sit down and really confront the reality of it. Right. And I was on that flight back from Taiwan and I was just kind of making a mental checklist of like what, um, what I, what I care about. And the only thing, you know, I sort of say that it's, it's like a double-edged sword with baseball players, because if you play baseball for what, 10 years, you sort of have the assumption that like, Oh, I, like whatever dream I follow, I'm going to just be great at, you know, because everybody has their, their dream list, but like usually it's baseball's over when you're like 13, then it's like, now what? And you start going down that list. And so for me, that list was like, you know, film and TV were the, the things that I loved uh, beyond baseball. And so it was just like, okay, well, what does that mean? And it was just sort of like a process of whittling, whittling it down to like, how do I create, um, a career in, in that world and what does that even look like and so got back to austin and austin has a vibrant independent film scene and uh volunteered like went on craigslist and found a couple productions that i volunteered on and um just immediately loved it man like just immediately understood my place in that world 
and how, uh, how that would fulfill me and, and really take all of that focus and energy that I had with baseball and, and just channel it somewhere else. Um, and yeah, so I, I mean, it was maybe two weeks after I was kind of done with baseball that I knew that like, all right, let's, we're hitting the ground running with this. Yeah. And you decided to go back to school at university of Texas and, uh, and, and start looking into the, the film part of the school. What do you remember about that whole process? And then you ended up coming out to LA. So what was it like? I remember you talking about being a 29 year old and being able to focus just on school. So what do you remember about going back to UT? Yeah, my, uh, my time at UT was, um, incredible. Like, again, like I, I enjoyed, I enjoyed the idea of get, being back somewhere at school and not having the pressures of like a 20 year old. Like I wasn't trying to be cool or, or, you know, go to frat parties or meet chicks. You know, it was just, <laughs> it was literally, I could go all in and, and get the most out of like an incredible experience. And so I was, dude, I mean, I was all like, I was at that school from eight in the morning until like 10 at night, I would do all my classes. And then I would sneak into the auditoriums and watch movies on the, the big screens. And I was just, I was living it up, man. It was, it was a ton of fun uh, to kind of dive head first into that. Um, but yeah. And so I, I did that for a few semesters and then they have a program where you can kind of study abroad in LA for film students. And so I jumped at that, came out here and, you know, tried to start setting some roots and, and, and figuring out how, uh, you know, and of course coming to LA is just a whole different, you know, it's just, it's, it's a lot when you're trying to get in the film industry along with, you know, it's like minor league baseball and steroids where like every, every day there's a thousand new people moving here trying to make it happen. But, uh, but at the same time, that's, that's a lot of, there's an energy here because of that, that is really cool. And it, and it, it, it's really easy to kind of be fueled by all the people around you trying to do amazing things. Yeah, for sure. And you decide to stay out in LA after you were studying abroad from, from school and, uh, you got it, you had to find a first gig. So what was your first job that you uh, started working on when you got to LA? So my first real job was sort of a dream to be honest with you i i got um through a few weird connections i became i got i was able to become a pa on the reboot of arrested development which was my favorite show of all time and so i got to you know i actually had that job on the weekends while i was still going to school so that was like i mean truly a dream like getting to be on a, a legit hollywood set on something that I was so passionate about was, was really cool. And then that really sort of kind of pushed me in the direction of where I wanted to go. Because when you first come out here, I feel like you want to do everything. Like you want to direct, you want to write, you want, you just, but you, there's just too much, man. Like you gotta, you know, you gotta start specializing and, and that show being able to, because being in school, I feel like you can learn, you learn, what it means to do a certain job, right? Like you can read the definition, but it's all like theory until you come out to LA and see like, Oh, like on paper, that's what this person does. But like now watching them every day from like eight in the morning to eight at night, what they do, like it's completely different than what you expected. So that, that was like a really cool four or five months getting to kind of uh, learn through that. And then, and then immediately I thought that I needed to be at a, a talent agency because that's sort of the hub of information. That's where you learn the most, the quickest in terms of like how the world, how the industry is interconnected, how projects go from an idea to a script, how you sell it. You know, so I, I really wanted to jump in, learn as much as I could there and then, and then, you know, take it to the next level. And so I, I did a talent agency after that, which I, I credit like my first reel. That was my first 12 hours a day you know, five days a week type job, like starting in the mailroom. And so, yeah, that was, that was something else too, you know, it's, uh, which, which was great, man. And again, like I, it's grunt work and stuff, but at the same time, I was so excited to be doing something new. Like every day was a new challenge to me, man. I showed up with my suit on going, sitting in the dark mailroom. And, uh, but every day was, was a challenge because I had no clue what to expect. And that, you know, 
there's something exciting about that. Yeah, I hear you on that. I mean, you got to start somewhere. So you end up, is that when you were working for AMC or did you go to AMC studios after that? So I did, so I did that for a couple of years and then that's what I did is like, as soon as I got to a spot where I felt like, okay, I'm getting bored. And, I, and when I say bored, I just mean like, okay, I'm starting to understand how this all works. Now I need to transition to something else to learn some more. So I, from that, I went to a production company and worked there for two, for a couple of years. And they had a deal with NBC. So it was something where we were trying to make TV shows for specifically AMC. And then I, I jumped from that over to AMC, which was, you know, and that was like, okay, I want to learn on the production side. But then it was like, okay, now I'd love to be on the studio side where now instead of coming up with ideas to pitch to other people, I've got people coming in every day pitching stuff to me. Right. So that was, um, again, I mean, they, they were all such great experiences. And then um, did some time with that. And it just, as, as much as I loved it, as much as I was learning, um, I just got to a point where I, you know, you just ultimately you want to make something for yourself. You want to make something that like truly speaks to you and your, for lack of a better term, brand. Because at AMC, you might, somebody might come in and pitch you the greatest thing in the world. But if it doesn't fall under that very specific brand of AMC, then it's a pass. No matter how amazing it is, if it doesn't fall under that sliver of what they're trying to do, you have to kind of let stuff just go away. And, um, and then I, I found, I saw a short film that I really loved and became friends with the director and he turned it into a feature script and uh, sent it to me and I absolutely loved it. And I told him, I was like, man, if, if you let me, I've never made a, I've never produced a movie, uh, but if you'll let me produce this, I will quit my job at AMC tomorrow. And he was like, okay, let's do it. And so I didn't, I mean, I, I told him the next, the next day that I was leaving, but I didn't, I didn't just bail the next day. Right. <laughs> I found my replacement, did it the right way. But, uh, but yeah, it was, that was sort of like the North star that I, I really wanted to, to, you know, and again, I think it kind of harkens back to that idea of like, if I'm going to get released from a team, I want to do it on my own term. You know, I want to do, I want to do it by uh, pitching my way. And with this, it was like, even if this movie's no good, like I, I, the, the older you get and the more you get ingrained in the system, the harder it is for you to take those chances to quit a job and go make a movie. Right. So um, I felt like it was kind of the right time. Like, you know, I, I wasn't too established to where I was like committing career suicide or whatever, but I was also like, um, I felt like I'd paid enough dues that I thought I could go off and, and execute this movie. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about it. So um, you decided to go and make this independent film. What was the name of it? What was the concept? What was the whole movie all about? Yeah, so it, it stems from a short film uh, of the same name called Thunder Road. And the short film is, I saw it at South by Southwest uh, 2017 and 2016. And it's, it's a 12 minute short film shot in one take, no edits. Wow. And it's a, it's a police officer giving a eulogy at his mom's funeral. And it's so heartbreaking and it's so funny. And it just, it just tapped a nerve, man. It was, it was like my, like my type of tone, like dark, but also funny, um, you know, and just, it just, whatever reason it triggered something in me and I couldn't get it out of my head. And, um, and it was a very successful short film. It won Sundance and, it was, you know, it was very highly touted, um, but I, I was just obsessed with it. And I got in touch with the director and brought him in and we had some meetings and, um, you know, a lot of people, the instinct is like, what are you doing next? Like, what's your next idea? But with me, I was very much like, yo, what, what happens to that character? Like, do you have a film in mind? He's like, and he's like, not really. He's like, it's just sort of a moment in time that I wanted to, to portray with this uh but i really like kept egging him on man and he he came back six months later with a script and i was like dude let's like let's develop this but at the same time like i feel like i really i need to make this for whatever reason and he felt the same way and um 
yeah, we just, we went off and we went to Austin and made it, man. It was, it was a wild experience. And, um, a lot of really cool things came full circle with that. Whereas I saw it at South by Southwest um, and we premiered like our, the first festival we got into was South by Southwest. And that was just the greatest thing ever. And then we ended up actually winning the festival, the best film at the festival Damn. or the, the grand, the grand jury prize. And so, um, and then right after we won that, the after party, the festival after party was at the theater that I saw the original short film at. So it was just all these really cool moments with that yeah. film, man. It's, um, it's super, super cool. And actually today, I think it was three years ago today that uh, we, we, we wrapped production. See, so that's how over- we got you on today, because it all means I something. I know, man. It all means something. So, um, but, it, but it, had, it had a fantastic run, man. We did that traditional sort of um, festival. It was a festival darling, man. We won a ton of international festivals. I got to go to Cannes in France, and, and we premiered there. And uh, I got to go to Vienna and Amsterdam and, you know, uh, just a, a, a ton of these really, like, super uh, high-end uh, international film festivals that, like, you only dream about going to if, if you're ever trying to make a film and, and i'm just i'm a huge sucker for film festivals like if they're just such an amazing place to go and experience movies with other people because you're truly surrounded by like like-minded war like no matter where what movie you're in you're there with people that want to see movies and are passionate about it so you know it's just uh it's a great experience and then to be able to, to go to one with your own film is just uh yeah man it's 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 a dream it was and to see other cultures respond to it in such a high i mean it was such a specific very small like about a the movie's about like a texas a small town texas police officer dealing with the loss of his mother and to have people in in austria like cry and Uh and and ask so many questions about it was just super uh Super fulfilling, man. Something we never could have anticipated. Yeah, and I was going to ask you, you know, because your film did so well, did you ever get reached out to by production companies, by other directors? Like, you would think that would launch you into a new realm of directing or producing in movies. Did any of that happen? Yeah, I mean, it, for sure. It's, it's, but it's very much at the same time, you know, it's, it's sort of like baseball where it's just like, uh, what have you done for me lately? You know, it's like, you know, Kershaw, I love how Kershaw always talks about like, it's literally about no matter how good your game is, like the only thing people care about is your next start. Right. Um, but yeah, it was, you know, it was, uh, I mean, I still get unsolicited stuff all the time. People hitting me up with scripts and stuff, but yeah. And um, we got, I got a couple things that I'm working on now, but it's, it's definitely, you know, it's definitely a hustle. So I, we made it and then we distributed it and did the festival thing for about 18 months. And as much as I, I loved it, it was after that experience that I really wanted to figure out a way to produce, but also tap into my old life of baseball. So like, how, how can I connect those dots? Because film is fantastic, man, but it's, it's very much giving everything to one project for you know however long 18 months or whatever and it's and for every thunder road that was made that year there were you know a thousand ones that were not successful and people you know and and it's not that um i guess the best way to say is it's a really hard thing to do and i feel like the way i want to approach film is when I come across a story that I have to tell a story that like means so much to me that I want to tell, like the idea of, you know, a lot of production companies, just because of the business model, you kind of have to have like 12 or 15 projects going at any one time. And, and, you know, you're developing all these different things in order to make the business model work. And I just, that was always the hardest part for me was I always felt like when you had a slate of movies, none of them were getting their what they deserved you know it was almost like the jerry Maguire thing you know like less clients more personal attention it felt like that where it was like 
man, you, you just, when you're trying to develop for, for so many different things, like I just, I love the idea of finding something that is like, I have to, I have to get this story out into the world. So, um, you know, and, and there's, I've got a couple things that I'm really kind of circling right now that I'm excited about. Um, but, but again, like I'm, I'm really fired up about this, uh, you know, connecting the dots with baseball because it, it is so much a part of me and it's so much, uh, and I still, I feel like there are just so many stories that anybody that's played pro ball, you ask them and they're like, they all have stories and they, they all feel like their experience has never really been represented in movies or, or TV, you know, like there's a few bull Durham and yeah, bull you know, Durham's some, close. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a, oh, it's what else? I mean, there's, you know, major league is, has some kind of funny stuff, but that's more of like a, a slapstick comedy. Not the true – I'd say Bull Durham is probably the closest if you're talking about minor league life. I, I, I totally agree. And, you know, you talked to – I had a, a long conversation this spring with Ron Shelton, who wrote it and directed it, and he played minor league ball. And he was like, you know, I wanted to make a movie where the end of it wasn't about the big game. It wasn't about the walk-off home run because that's not how baseball is. And – that's not how your career is. Your career doesn't end with this. It's usually a whimper as opposed to a bang, you know? So uh, I think he really captured that sort of, uh, that feeling in that movie. But, but at the same time, how are we not due for an updated Bull Durham in, in the sense of like, you know, in that movie, you know, they, when they called their girlfriend, they had to stop at a gas station and use the payphone. Like, right. I want to see I want to see some baseball stuff where we're in a world where there's Tinder and uh, kids dealing with haters social on social media. media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, now that and would be cool. You sort of can't just anonymously go and take your take your your lumps in the minor leagues anymore. Yeah, you know I, I know some guys that like they play fantasy baseball, but it's only for minor leaguers. And I'm like, what the hell is wrong with you? Like, leave these kids alone. Quit yeah. putting, don't put pressure on them to like or pump up your fantasy stats. That's insane. Having to sign binders full of your uh, minor league cards, hoping that one of these guys pops and becomes something he could sell a minor league card, like ridiculous stuff like that for these yeah. collectors. Yeah. For sure, man. It's, uh, I always loved, I, it was just crazy how you would get those like handwritten notes yeah. And they would try to, you know, it would be like a collector, but he would try to make it seem like it's a little boy. Right. And it's like, no, 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 don't, don't send that back. Like we all get those. That's like some dude in, in the, Albany, New York, who has a, an eBay account. The weird ones, now that you reminded me of this, the weird ones were like the blank index card. Like, hey, put your signature on this. Yeah. It'll be worth something. For sure. Dude, no. I'm not signing it unless it's a card or a baseball. No doubt, man. It, it's, I had uh, one of our pitching coaches was a grizzly old bitter vet, man. He just – I don't know why he was in baseball because he seemed to hate it. But anytime we had to do those team signing sessions, um, you know, you just line up and they, they come through. Guys, people would give him cards. And if it wasn't a kid, if it was anybody over like 15, instead of signing it, he would just scratch out the whole card yeah. like with the Sharpie. <laughs> yeah. And it was such a dick move, but I, it was impressive. Like to be that big of a dick is impressive. <laughs> And you can get away with it when you're a salty minor league coach, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask you about working for Momentum. So um, explain kind of what they're about. I, they're in the kind of along the lines of what you wanted to do. So what is Momentum and then, you know, who's behind it and the whole deal with them? Yeah. So after when I got back from that kind of international festival circuit, I really wanted to make those connections uh, and, and figure out how to work in baseball. And um I just found, you know, I found on YouTube, there was a really cool mini documentary about Trevor Bauer. And it was just, you could tell that whoever did it was trying to do some next level storytelling. Like it wasn't, it wasn't like a ESPN, like three minute segment, you know, before a game on Saturday. It just, it had like an indie vibe to it. And I really liked it. And I just reached out to him and it turns out it, it was Trevor's, it was like, his buddy made that documentary for him and he was so impressed with it that they, they sort of, they made a company out of it. And, and, you know, if you know anything about Trevor, like he gets his mindset to something and he, he gets it done. 
And uh, yeah, yeah I've played, he... played with him in the minors for in double A just for reference. But yes, I, I definitely know yeah. who, who he is. He's definitely, you know, he's got his quirks, but really smart guy. He was apparently really instrumental in the restart of, you know, baseball during COVID. Like, and his people, his opinions carry weight. So anyway, yeah, continue on, sure. on power. Yeah. And he, I think he sees that he sees the, the way that baseball has slipped through the cracks and how it's not marketed the way it is. And he, he wants, he wants to be the change that affects it. You know, he wants to um, market players better. Like we, so, so he started momentum and that, that's the idea. Like, how do we just like, how do we take these guys and make them celebrities? And how do we take, how do we make stories? How can we tell these stories that we all want to tell, but nobody has told. And, um, so he just started doing some wild stuff, man, kind of doing stuff without asking permission. So, you know, they went that first spring training two years ago. Uh, they had his cameraman there at the game, but they just mic'd up Trevor and didn't ask for permission. So like Trevor's pitching in a game in spring training, but he's also talking on this mic. And then they made a video of it and it went crazy viral. And yeah. Um, and you know, he's just, he's, he sees, he sees the value in, in being, uh, you know, if, if MLB is not going to market you, market yourself. So he's got vlogs and he, he man, I, whether you're a fan or not, like he takes you on the inside and shows you what it's like being a, a baseball player. He totally and does. I, I love it when he does the, the McGregor walk. He, you could, I guess it's a stretch, but he is kind of the McGregor, Conor McGregor of baseball now. Yeah. And, and, and if you see the, the McGregor, it's, but it kind of works in this sort of media ecosystem. Yeah. So if you watch Sports Center and you see him do the Conor McGregor walk, you're like, dude, what, what the, what, you know, what the f? He's but if you follow him on social, you realize that like, oh, it's part of like a longer narrative that has been in his vlogs and he's tweeted about. And you know, there was a, a game this year where he, it was like if he set the record for strikeouts in the first four starts then uh Budweiser was going to make a can uh specifically for the Reds it was going to be a Budweiser can and it was going to be tailored for Cincinnati Reds fans and so when he did it in the game like he did it beat the record and then he like turns and he pretends like he's opening a can <laughs> and he pretends like he's drinking and again if you're just watching these antics with no context you're like this guy's an idiot or this guy like it was but when you follow what he's actually doing, it's like, oh, he's like, he just did something really unique for the city of Cincinnati and the whole fan base. He's so very I aware think, of what he's doing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and whether you like it or not, it truly comes from a place of wanting to better the game, wanting to better his teammates, wanting to get uh, the word out there about all these great players. And, and, you know, and, and even on the baseball side, like, I'm surprised more people aren't talking about it in the media, but I'm not surprised one bit that he won the Cy Young this year and the guy who won the Cy Young in the other league was basically a guy he mentored for a couple of years, Shane Bieber. Yeah, so, both with Cleveland. At yeah, the time. so it's yeah. – exactly. So it's like it, it, that's not a fluke that – like what Trevor's doing on the field and with his, uh, you know, biomechanics and – like that stuff's legit. So, and I mean, but at the end of the day, it has to be, if you're going to put yourself out there in the media and make yourself a target, you better back it up. So for right. him, so for him to start a media company, talk all the smack about it or whatever. And then win the Cy Young, it's, it's pretty impressive, man. That is impressive. I'm, I'm pumped for him. I agree. So, yeah, so, I, so I, I got on with those guys and worked with them up until this summer. Um, and, and yeah, it, it was fantastic. We did a ton of amazing stuff. And um, I just wanted to, you know, we, I wanted to go in a little different direction and they were focusing on some other things, but like I, uh, we did some really cool stuff. We did, um, the thing I'm probably most proud of is we did a, uh, uh, she was, it's called Bauer Bites. And it was like a, a dinner talk show that we did during spring training uh, this year before it got shut down. And it was, pretty incredible man we were shooting two or three episodes a week but we had unbelievable guests dude we flew in kenny lofton eric gagne you know we had bieber liam hendricks ron shelton 
We had uh, the drummer from Trevor's favorite hard rock band who uh, is a huge baseball fan. Like it was just super cool to get these four people, like these dinners with, with four, these unique groups of four guys at a time. Yeah. And just have, you know, John Boy, we had John Boy come in who, you know, is blown he, up sort of in the baseball media. Yeah, he made a name for himself kind of exposing the Astros for the, the cheating scandal. He was huge on social yeah. media, so he kind of made a name Dude, for himself. He, that guy – that guy is a hustler. And so, <laughs> but it was just, it was, it was really fantastic, man. We did it, you know, we, we brought in a production designer and it was just su something I'm super proud of. And you can find all that stuff on YouTube, but like, if you're a fan of, of the game and the insights, like getting those guys together to talk about, you know, current baseball, but also, uh, you know, we had Eric Gagne and Ron Shelton were on the same episode. So for them, it was almost like we had the last three generations of, you know, we had Shelton who played in the eighties and then we had Gagne sort of the king of the late nineties, early two thousands. And then, uh, you know, Bauer, who's the best pitcher in the world right now. So, uh, yeah, it, it, that was cool. And, and I think, I think it's working. I think, I think he's, I think through a lot of the stuff he's doing with momentum, it's pressuring MLB to start giving out their content a little bit more because they see how people were like that video of, of Trevor mic'd up during the game at spring training got millions of views and MLB was like, Oh, Oh shit. And now, you know, at the all-star games and even in the playoffs, I think they were every game they had a guy mic'd up. Yeah. And it's like, that's, that's not a coincidence. Like that comes from, you know, I always told Trevor that all of these moves that, momentum is making they're going to put together sort of an unofficial trevor bauer rules for mlb you know because if everybody jumped on the train that trevor's doing and tried to do their own thing it would just like you, you know because immediately they had to have like an emergency meeting to say okay we can't let players mic themselves up and so they had to like instate that rule within like a week because all of a sudden it was like well, we're just gonna do this every game and they're like you know, something they never even thought about. So, yeah, yeah, man, he, he's, he's a great dude. And he's super savvy. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see where the success of him on, like his success on the field, how it sort of drives this train with the media company. Yeah, maybe once he signs, you, uh, you'll have to help me get him on the show because I did play with him and I could reach out to him, but maybe I can try to get him on the, on the podcast here. Yeah, dude, Makes absolutely. He would, I, I bet he would love it, man. He, yeah. he, um, he loves talking about the game and, you know, what's, I think to kind of sum up Trevor a little bit, the thing that I find most interesting about him is he's so futuristic in, in his thinking of like, he, you know, he wants to, he tracks everything, right? He tracks his like blood level every day, he takes his blood every morning and he's got all these people, he's got a team of dietitians and stuff. And so he's on top of all of it. Um, but, and, and I think there's this this um, image of him out there that he's trying to like hurt the game or change the game in a bad way. But truly what he's trying to do is he wants to get back to old school baseball. Like he wants, he wants to play on a team that will let him pitch every fourth day. And so he started like, cause he loved, like he wants to go throw back to the seventies where guys pitch complete games all the time. And so it's, it's, it's cool to see how he's embracing new technology but in order to kind of be a throwback player. And I think, you know, the reason he does all the tracking is he said it before is, is it's like he thinks he can pitch every fourth day and throw 130 pitches a, a game, but he needs to be able to prove it. So he needs to be able to show that like his biometric markers are actually more optimal on a fourth day after a start than on the fifth day. So like I, I can only assume that during these free agent talks, he's going to walk into the room with a binder full of like, I want to be, I want to pitch every fourth day. I don't want a pitch limit. And he's going to be able to sit there and prove to them with hard data that I can do this. Like he, like, you know, and it's, it's, it's impressive, man. It's hard. It's hard not to be impressed. Well, if he's going to be somebody's $200 million man, we'll see what they allow him to do because that's a big investment in somebody. And if you're going to let somebody be on their own rules, then you guys, you got, it's a fine line there between on both sides. Well, you know, you know, the whole thing with him and, 
he says he's only going to sign one year deals. Oh, okay. So even that's even more sketchy for him because if you burn yourself out, I know you, you lose a five year, six year deal, which is you know the safe bet there. But yeah, if he wants to bet on himself yeah. again, then and I, that's I, it, that you can't get any better than right now though. If I were advising him, I would just say, look, this is as good as it's going to get. You could get a huge long term deal here. Why jeopardize it with a one year deal? Yeah, and his his whole thing is he thinks. He thinks um, a long, a long-term deal. He thinks if he's doing year to year, it'll keep, it'll keep him more focused. He'll be able to always play for a contender, and ultimately there'll be more money in it. If, if, you know, a, a, in terms of year at a time. But this yeah. is the first time he's this. But this is his first year of free agency. So, sure. like, who knows? But, um, you know, he's always sworn that he was just he. No matter what, he was only going to sign one-year deals, but. I guess we'll when find out. Nine, when they put nine figures in front of you, you know. Say no to that. It changes the game a little yeah. bit. So. No, I hear you. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you. So be, all the stuff you took from Momentum, you know, now is transitioning to the company you're with now, which is Diamante Media Group. And you're now, you know, coming full circle with your old uh, minor league buddy, Ryan Spielborgs, who works with us. And he's on MLB Network. Not us, sorry. Diamante <laughs> Network and, and uh, yeah. MLB Network. What's the what's the the case now for you and what you're wanting to do with this new media group that you're with? Um, yeah, it was you know what I what I love about Diamante. I mean, first off, like again, Ryan was one of my uh, favorite teammates of all time, and just somebody that like I completely trust and somebody that like I I want to I want to be. You know, he's the type of guy that like makes you better and want to do great things. You know, he, he's one of those guys. So. I love the idea of getting to work with him, but also I, I love the idea of being in the media space where I can kind of, rather than making individual projects, I love the idea of finding people that are making interesting stuff and sort of creating sort of like a incubator of sorts, a minor league system of sorts where I can, where we can help find people that are telling unique stories and putting themselves out there and creating cool stuff and how we can help better bring them into the fold and help get them more exposure and, and blow and sort of approach it for more from like a, a distribution channel as opposed to actually just making the product. And so that, that's what fires me up because I, I want to be, you know, there's, there's kids out there in the minor leagues and in college that are, that have like YouTube channels and they're they're putting their life out there, man. And they're and they're they're making stuff. And maybe they don't know what they're doing, but like to be able to kind of uh, identify those types of players that have cool, interesting perspectives, and giving them the resources and expertise that they need to kind of like grow their voice. Like that's what really gets me excited. Sort of the same thing I did with Thunder Road. You know, the idea of of finding something. And, and doing what I can to help facilitate somebody I believe in. And that's what I, that's what I kind of want to do with Diamante, where it's people with, like yourself, with a podcast, people that have YouTube channels, people that are just, uh, I mean, it could be anything. Somebody that's like killing it on TikTok. Again, like it's, it's, it's really close-minded to, to, not, um, to not be open to like all these new technologies and how how somebody can go from, you know, just doing little behind the scenes insight to their life, how they can turn that into like a legit business. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, 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 all that stuff really excites me, man. And, and trying to find like a, a collective of these people um, and bring them into the fold and, and really kind of cross, you know, a lot of these, a lot of like buzzwords, but like cross brand with people and like identifying somebody that's doing something really cool and a brand that's doing something really cool. And how can we get these two guys together and, and help create content that's beneficial for both parties? Um, that stuff, you know, when it's, when it's in the baseball world, is exciting to me. Um, yeah, man. And I just, I just love working with really uh, passionate, um, energized, creative people. 
I hear you, man. It's awesome. And, and you know, I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, working with you. And, and of course, shout out to Antone as well, the main guy behind Diamante Media Group. Um, but yeah, especially to take some of this stuff for the next level, a lot of people just need opportunities. So uh, I'm excited to hopefully to do some stuff with you and, and the Diamante crew. Yeah, no, this is great. I, um, I'm excited as well. And, you know, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, uh, I could do better creating content than sitting in a dark car. I know. I was thinking about this. Back. If you're watching on YouTube, eventually when this comes out, you're going to see this great indie film producer sitting in the dark. So uh, this one, this but could you, be an Apple podcast one. Hey, but you have to tell them I started off in a really cool park with really cool lighting and there were trees in the background and it was really nice, but there were some crazy people playing music. So we had exactly. to take to the car. Yes. Th so this my, is third location here for Zach. Go ahead. My, my intention was there, but uh, <laughs> it was just a, a slow 45 minute fade to black. You know what? That's okay. It's kind of, it sets the mood, I guess, a little bit maybe, you know? So yeah. I, I, I expect that we'll have better uh, entertainment value and, and media, you know, film sessions when we, when we get going here. Yeah, man. I can't, I can't wait, dude. <laughs> I'm, I'm pumped with what you're doing. I'm excited to, to take it as far. There's just so many, you know, again, man, podcasts have come such a long way. Like there's no reason to think that you can't take something like this that started off in your, your house during a pandemic and 18 months later be doing live episodes at, on a minor league ballpark after the game, you know, doing live shows and stuff like there's just, there's a, there's a lot to be done with, with podcasting. And it's just, it's about telling your story and, and, and being, uh, being energetic and getting out there and, and just doing it, man, talking to people and, and doing the thing. So I, I commend you on, um, on your hustle, man. And I'm excited to see where it takes us. Thank you very much. Yeah. I and mean, thank you for, you know, even entertaining me as somebody that could possibly do this. So I'm, I'm glad we got to meet and uh, I'm really excited for the future. And uh, I guess everybody stay tuned once we get some of this stuff going, but Zach, you were great. Thank you for, for coming on the show. And uh, I'll definitely be talking to you soon, man. Yeah, man. Thanks for this. This is fantastic. All right. My thanks to Zach Parker. Thank you very much for uh, listening to the show today. Hope you got something out of it and uh, really look forward to hopefully working with him and uh, some others uh, with his uh, media group. We can get some stuff going for the podcast and see where it goes. So we're working on it and uh, I appreciate the support and, and listening to the show and uh, all of you guys that follow us. Thank you very much. I uh, hope you enjoyed it today. As always, you can follow me on social media at Two Tall Sports Podcast. That's Instagram. On Twitter, it's at Two Tall Sports my YouTube channel. Just type in Two Tall Sports Podcast. You'll find all the videos from the shows there if you'd like to watch. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for listening and we'll see you next week for another great episode. Have a good day.